I've been teaching people how to cook for 30 years, and over that time, our appreciation for food and of the people who produce it has increased dramatically. Good food is so important, and for this series, I've created a new set of menus that showcase some of the finest ingredients we produce in Ireland. I hope these recipes will bring great pleasure to you and the people you cook for. Lamb's kidneys really are a bit like marmite. You either love them or you hate them. I love them. I grew up eating them. In this starter salad, I'm pairing them with lovely salad leaves tossed with a hazelnut oil dressing. Then shallots, which are cooked slowly until they're tender, and then crispy straw potatoes on top. So a really lovely combination of flavors, textures, colors, delicious things to eat. I love this salad. The first element of this recipe are these little caramelized shallots. And in this case today, I'm going to cook them very slowly until they melt to a really sort of tender consistency. They all go into a saucepan with a good pinch of sugar because we want this to caramelize. So a good pinch of sugar like that, and then some butter. This will give a sort of a lovely syrupy glaze. Um, water, just to get the ball rolling so they don't stick on you. Sprig of thyme. I'm going to put in all of that thyme like that. Be delicious. And then a small sprinkle of salt, not too much salt. And definitely, they will benefit from a little pepper. Once these are cooked, and they take half an hour maybe, they're there about sometimes up to three quarters of an hour to cook, they will look like this. Super tender and soft, still holding their shape, but cloaked in this lovely sort of buttery, oniony, shallotty caramel. The next thing I need, I'm going to make a little vinaigrette, because this is a salad after all. A warm salad, or in France what they would call a salade tiède. And for the vinaigrette, I've got some hazelnut oil. It could be walnut oil, or it could be olive oil as well for that matter. All very carefully measured. And I'm going to make my little vinaigrette in here um, in a jam jar, to shake it, which makes it really handy. Um, a little bit of sunflower oil to temper um, the uh, strength of the hazelnut oil, vinegar to sharpen it, all carefully in proportion. A little pinch of mustard to add a bit of sort of richness and depth like that. And then of course, a pinch of salt and pepper. And sometimes I might put the tiniest, tiniest little pinch of sugar. I mean, I'm talking minuscule like that. And what that does is it just rounds off the sort of sharpness of the vinegar into your jam jar. Shake like that to emulsify, to get the oil, oils in our case, and vinegar to mix. And that's it. Couldn't be easier. But the whole thing is to measure out your ingredients carefully for that before you start. Now, the next thing I need are these little straw potatoes. So I've peeled a potato and I've cut them into little matchstick type shapes. And I'm using a deep fryer here. So drop them into your fryer and then don't play with them too much in the first instance because you don't want to break them up. You want them to hold the lovely shape that they have. So you can give a little shake like that if you can't bear not to. But actually, the less you shake that, the better. Great. These are lovely sort of golden color now, just the way I like them, lovely and crisp. So then just drop them out onto a little bit of kitchen towel. They could be kept warm in a low oven, or if you're going to have the salad straight away, just at room temperature will be fine. Aren't they just lovely? I love that sort of lovely golden nature. Turn off my fryer, and not forgetting, of course, a little pinch of salt on there. Now, the main event is the kidney itself. And this is a lamb's kidney, so they're quite small. And they often come enrobed, if you like, in this lovely fat, which you have to re remove. So. Now the kidney is at this end, as you can see there, like that. So I'll cut off that fat. Then cut into what feels to you like the middle of the kidney. You may not be absolutely accurate, but you'll go fairly close. Then if you carefully prise off the fat, and there's also a little membrane there. And if you're careful, they both come off at the same time. So just pop it out. This is very satisfying, I have to tell you. Like that. OK. Now. I want to get rid of some of the plumbing, which wouldn't do you any harm, by the way, if you ate it, it's just the texture isn't so nice. So that gristly bit there, you just cut out. 
Okay, lovely. And then in this case, I'm just going to cut these into little dice. Another day, I might be cooking them in this size, but for a salad like this, I sort of cut them into three strips and then into little dice like that. Sort of a generous centimeter, I suppose, in size. If they're too small, they lose their charm in the pan. Now, we're pretty much ready to go ahead and um, assemble our salad. I'm going to serve this family style today. You could, of course, do individual salads if you want. When you're ready to assemble, a little bit of olive oil in the pan, nice hot pan, and then kidneys going in straight away. Oh, I love these. Salt and pepper. Sometimes they flame a little, which adds a little bit of excitement to your kitchen. While the kidneys are cooking, take your salad leaves, and I need about sort of the equivalent of about four handfuls here. I've got kale, mustard greens, all sorts of lovely things in here. Shake your dressing well. Pour less dressing than you think you need onto the salad. Less than you think you need, you can always add more. Toss, tease, glaze the leaves. Then I can be placing my caramelized shallots around the edge of my salad. And we mustn't forget about those absolutely delicious caramelized juices. Our straw potatoes go on next. Gracious me. And then finally, I'm going to sprinkle my kidneys warm around the salad. So the hot element always goes on last, and then you go straight to the table. So here, we're talking about different flavors, textures, and also different temperatures. I am going to just put a sprinkling of marjoram leaves, because lamb and marjoram is heaven. If I didn't have them, I wouldn't be weeping, but because I have them, I'm joyful. And this is a joyful thing. Everybody needs a couple of really quick, easy and simple recipes in their repertoire, but that will, of course, deliver a delicious result. This gratin of fish with Gruyere cheese, mustard and cream is super easy and super delicious. So I've got my fish. I'm using cod today, which has been skinned and filleted. You do that yourself or ask your fishmonger to do it for you and put it into an oven proof dish. You could use a mixture of fish here in, indeed if you want to and no need to put any salt on the fish at this stage but I do like to put a bit of pepper. So far pretty easy it has to be said and so it continues. Now I have got my cheese. I'm using a Gruyere cheese. You could absolutely use a lovely Irish cheddar and it would be delicious. So coarsely grated, and that's not terribly important here, but I love the sort of grate you get from an old fashioned box grater. Then very simply, um, some mustard. And this is just, you know, just a classic French smooth mustard. It doesn't have to be French, but smooth mustard like that. And then a little bit of cream like that. It's as easy as pie. Little salt. We've already got pepper on the fish. So we don't need any more pepper. And I'm going to mix this into what looks like a pretty ugly mess. Then making sure your mustard as well spread through. Spread that over the fish. And it becomes even more unlikely looking as you go along. That's that simple as that goes into a moderate oven by 20 minutes or so until it gets gorgeous, bubbly and gratinated. Great, that will look much more delicious and appe appealing when it comes back out of the oven in about 20 minutes. There are so many different vegetables that will be good to serve with this. But I'm going to cook beetroot with my uh, gratin today. And I've got these lovely ruby beetroot. And I'm just using the root itself today. So, um, for this recipe, so just cut the beetroot, le about, leaving about, you know, sort of an inch and a half, three or four centimeters of the stalk still attached. And generally speaking, I don't break the tail. These go into a, a saucepan with cold water at this stage, and we're going to poach them. So pop the beets in, and then we're going to season the beetroot cooking water with a good pinch of salt, and perhaps surprisingly, a pinch of sugar, not to make them taste overly sweet, but the sugar 
enhances the flavor of the beetroot no end. So bring them to a simmer in the pot. You cook them onto the point where the skin will rub off easily. And to determine that point, you just lift one out because the, the water will be warm. And just using a slotted spoon, just pull like that. And you know they're cooked. Now, okay, I'm just breaking off the stalks there carefully, rubbing off the skin. I mean, it's a, I was going to say a bloody business, but it's definitely um, can be a messy business here. Removing the last little bit of the skin like that. Lovely. And I can put that then um, to one side. Now, I'm going to cut them into little wedges. So I go to the midpoint of the beetroot, the super tender, go back to the midpoint of the halved beetroot and cut it from there. And then you get little wedges and they sit up nicely. It means, you know, when you're presenting them later on, it makes a nice presentation. So now they go into a saucepan or it could be a frying pan for that matter. And again, perhaps seeming a little unusual here. All the beetroot's going in like that. Lovely. And I am going to use some of these lovely stalks. I don't see any advantage in wasting all that delicious food. Then cream again here like that. A little bit of butter, which is going to bring delicious flavor. A squeeze of lemon juice. So here's where the piquant nature of the dish comes in. So another pinch of salt, a pinch of sugar and a nice twist of pepper. And you put these on the heat and you bubble them up and hey ho, that's your pecan beetroot ready to go. Great, so I'm going to bring that to a gentle simmer and once that's heated and once our gratin is a lovely golden color and our fish is cooked, we'll be ready to serve. So my gratin is bubbling golden, looking cheesy and delicious in the oven. And my beetroots have just bubbled up and they are ready to serve. So the beetroots are now cloaked in a lovely sort of thin, deeply rich, it's even pinker than bubblegum, um, sort of pink. So I'm going to serve those. So I'll put my lovely stalks around the edge and try not to dribble too much. These stalks will be really, really delicious and they'll be a curiosity at your table for sure because we're not quite so familiar with them. But they really are wonderful and, you know, what would, it be, what would be the point in not having them? It's a really, really terrific dish. So let's not lose any of that lovely creaminess. So you see there's not a lot of sauce in the end and you don't want there to be a lot of sauce because it's cream. So just there are, there's a right amount and there's a point where it's uh, too much. Meanwhile, the gratin. Oh yeah, looks really, really perfect. It's just a thing of such ease, isn't it? Totally possible. I have a few little bay leaves just to do that. It's not entirely necessary at all. And the great thing about bay leaves is they don't wilt against a hot dish. If you put sprigs of parsley and the likes there, we probably just wilt. I think that's probably enough. A sprinkle of chives just to temper that color and to bring that sweet oniony flavor. Um, and then maybe a little sort of uh, pot of new potatoes or even rice with that. Really easy, really good, lovely. Irish linen used to be a feature in Irish households, whether it was the linen tea towel you used in the kitchen, built to last, or beautiful napkins for the table. They were just there. Sadly, our linen industry seems to have slowed down somewhat, but now there is a revival, a revival in these beautiful things, and it's being spearheaded by Sonia and Francie at Stable, and I'm thrilled. So when we started Stable, one of the things that we really wanted to do was to champion Irish linen. It is a fabric that we produce beautifully in this country, really, really beautifully, and we have a quality and an excellence that you can't find anywhere else. There's so much you can do with it, and, and it has extraordinary properties, in fact. 
One of the things that's interesting about the linen fabric to wear is that it's naturally thermostatic. So it keeps you cool when you're warm and it keeps you warm when you're cool. So it's an ideal fabric to wear as a scarf in particular. The other big property of linen which we love is that it's naturally antibacterial, meaning that bacteria doesn't grow on linen. And that's why linen was so popular as a fabric for textiles, for hospitals, for bedding, for a table, for kitchen. So last year during COVID, for example, we said, you know what, linen would be an extraordinary fabric to use as a face mask. They made wearing a mask more comfortable at a time when there was also very few masks available. As a plant, flax is very light on the land. It's a full use plant. We use the seeds for uh, our health. The flowers are massively important for pollinators. And the actual plant itself then is used as linen. So it's a very earth friendly textile for our times, which is really important. It's a real joy to come into this shop every day, to meet the customers that we meet, to tell the stories of all the products that we've designed and all the, all the accessories that we've designed and all the makers who work with us. Um, we're working with over 40 makers now from north, south, east, west of the country. So our objective really is to, is to keep promoting Irish linen. It's a beautiful fabric, sustainable, all good. Tick, tick, tick. Um, and we really want to encourage Irish people to, to come on board um, and see linen in a different way. Who doesn't love a pancake? And these crepe with orange butter are truly delicious. Pancakes are fried and then reheated in an orange flavoured butter, folded into little quadrants. And then this deliciously glossy, orangey, buttery, sugary sauce. All you need to go with that is some soft Irish whipped cream. So I'm going to start off making the crepe or the pancake batter. So I've got a little plain flour. I think it's always a good idea to save the flour just for lightness and also just in case something fell in to your flour bin. Okay, lovely. And then a little caster sugar, just to sweeten very little. I often put in a pinch of salt as well. Okay, mix your flour and sugar together. And then I'm going to put in two whole eggs, that's the yolk and the white. And then we're going to put in one egg yolk. It just makes for a slightly richer batter. You can keep your white for another day for meringues or souffles and so on. Lovely. That'll keep in the fridge or you could freeze it, of course. Now, and then we're ready to mix our batter. And what I like to do is to just break up the eggs a little bit like that. Pour in your milk in a, you know, steady stream. It, it, this doesn't need to take a half an hour. It's only really only a matter of minutes. So gradually drawing in the flour like that and then whisk very, very vigorously. You can use this batter straight away if you want to, but honestly, I prefer to rest it. And also what I like to do is to sieve it. And you'll see the value of this in a moment. Pour your batter through a sieve, scraping that out as much as you can. And now you can see there the way I, there are some little lumps of flour. So what I just get my um, rubber spatula, flexible spatula, and push that through. And that gives me such a lovely, fine, smooth batter. So normally that would go into the fridge now for a half an hour, an hour or several hours if you want to, in fact. So we usually add a little melted butter to the batter that's been resting. And when you add the butter, what you'll find is it's going to look quite strange because you're adding two to three tablespoons of melted butter into a cold batter and the butter sort of solidifies into funny little pieces. That is precisely how it should look. Just in case you make this and you're wondering what on earth has happened, what's happened is exactly what's supposed to have happened. Now, the choice of pan is yours. Some people like to use a non-stick pan. I like this uh, old crepe pan that I ha I've had for so many years, nearly as old as myself, which is saying something of the quality of a good cast iron pan like this. It's a proper French crepe pan. And what I like to do before I cook my first crepe is take a little bit of parchment or greaseproof paper, or it could be a butter wrapper for that matter, scrunch it up, like that, and then dip it in a little bit of butter, and then just grease the pan lightly like that. Okay, you can see my pan is hot because it's smoking. So I find for this pan, it takes a ladle and a little bit. And then quickly swirl the mixture to the edge of the pan, preferably not 
letting that batter go up along the sides. Then a little patience is required. You might find your pan is too hot or it's too cold. So you'll know that after you make your first crepe. Now, so what we're watching out for here is when the crepe colors around the edge. So I usually like to just loosen the crepe around the edges and then we're going in like that, just loosening. First one is always the trickiest one and turn it over like that, okay. The underneath side of the crepe cooks for a much shorter time, okay. So this is probably pretty much cooked now. So if I lift that up, I'll turn it over again just to show you. That's the color of the underneath sides, lovely. That's that part of the recipe done. The next thing I want to do is to make the orange flavored butter, uh, which we are going to reheat the crepe in for this particular recipe. So I have got some butter, which I've just um, beaten with a wooden spoon to get a sort of a creamy, lighter sort of consistency. To this, I'm going to add some sieved icing sugar. This is a sort of butter you might make for putting in the middle or on top of an orange cake. Then I have some orange zest. Quite simply, this looks like near the twain shall meet sort of scenario. Don't be tempted to add in water or anything like that, because quite soon, consistency of this will change. There she goes into a lovely orange butter like that. Right, and that's that. So, a larger frying pan this time, okay, going on the heat. And I'm going to use some of the orange butter and, very importantly, uh, orange juice to make the lovely syrup to reheat the crepes. So let your pan heat a little, pop in some of the orange uh, butter like that. Smell is wonderful as well when the heat hits us. We're going to add a little orange juice to this. Now, pop in your crepes into your orange butter and pretty much immediately fold them into half and then into little sort of quadrants like that. And I find I can get a couple at least in at a time. These are better served warm. You don't want to be serving these really too hot. So I do these in increments. So let's hope they just fall nicely on the plate for me. I like when they overlap a little bit like that. Now, I can also place some of my orange segments on. So you can imagine the way the orange segments are just going to give a delicious sort of lightness. They're absolutely optional. Now, that's what I'm after at this stage, a sort of a lovely syrupy sauce, neither too thick nor too thin. Pour it over like that. Great. And then that could absolutely be that. I have a few lovely little sprigs of lemon balm here, which seems appropriate enough. Maybe unnecessary, but appropriate. Lovely. Some softly whipped cream to go with those. An absolute treat.